we hear a woman talking on the phone to a furniture company. First, you have some time to look at questions 1 to 5. Now we shall begin. You should answer the questions as you listen, because you will not hear the recording a second time. Listen carefully and answer questions 1 to 5. Good afternoon, KT Furniture. Can I help you? Oh, uh, hello. Yes, um... I'm setting up a new office and I don't have internet access yet, but I'd like to place an order for some furniture. That's fine. You can do it over the phone and I can fill in the form for you this end. Oh, great. Thanks. I just need to take a few customer details first, if that's OK. Yes, fine. Uh, what name is it? My name? Yes. Oh, it's Sue Brown. Uh, Sue Brown. Thanks. And what's the name of your company, Miss Brown? It's a clothing company. Uh, it's called Dress Your Best. OK, I'll just note that down. Dress for best. No, your best. Oh, right. Got it. So you make smart clothes? Yes, formal dress for weddings and special occasions. We also repair and alter clothes. I see. And where are you located? What's your postal address? Right. Well, we're on Kirby Trading Estate. Kirby. How do you spell that? It's K-I-R-B-Y. Oh, I know that area. It's New Hampton Road, isn't it? Yes, that's right. Number 210 in South Down. OK. And can I have a contact number for our delivery man? Sure. It's probably best if I give you my mobile number. OK. The number's 09356 788 545. OK. Double seven eight. No, seven double eight. Five, four, five. Oh. OK, that's great. Now, just a couple more questions before I take your order. Fine. We have two delivery dates this month, and you should be able to have either. When are they? Well, there's one on the 16th of the month, but there's a charge of $40 for that one. Oh, that's a lot. Hmm. Or there's option two, which is the end of the month. I'll have to confirm the date later. And that's a free delivery. I'll take option two, thanks. I don't want to pay a charge. OK. I'll note down no charge. We haven't organised the office yet, so there should be plenty of time. Mm -hmm. And lastly, you don't have an account with us, so how would you like to pay? Oh, I'll pay by credit card. OK. Will that be Visa? Is American Express OK? Absolutely fine. Before you hear the rest of the conversation, you have some time to look at questions 6 to 10. Now listen and answer questions 6 to 10. So, what would you like to order? Well, I've been looking in your catalogue and you have some office chairs that look very comfortable for our type of work. Is there an item code? 
Yes, it's ASP 23. OK, those chairs come in pink, white and black. Yes, the pink looks nice, but I think the darker colour's better for us. You can see light materials on it more easily. <laughs> That's true. We'll have five of those, I think. OK, I've got that. Anything else? Do you have any striped mats? I'm sorry, not at the moment. They're out of stock. We should have some in next month. Never mind. Um, well... Um, I'd also like two of your glass desks. Oh, they're lovely, aren't they? Yes. You seem to have two sizes. Basically, large or small. I think the code for the small ones is... I think we'll have the large ones. The code here is TG586. OK. So, that's two glass desks. Any lamps for those? No. We have to get special lamps for our work. Oh, I see. Do you have another supplier for those? Yes. Um, we do need some furniture for our customers, though. OK, for a waiting area or something? Well, we have to discuss the work with them, so we need a nice sofa. Something soft and... I thought leather. Ah, yes, a good choice. There's a three-seater here, DFD44. That seems to be in red, cream or chocolate brown. Yes, it does come in yellow as well. Yellow? Hmm. I'd thought of red, but that sounds lively. Yes, I'll have that colour. I think brown's a bit too dull and cream shows the dirt too much. Yeah, you're right. Anything else? A coffee table, perhaps? Yes, I think so. Maybe TX22, the silver one? A very good choice. Well, that's it, I think. OK, I'll just add that up for you and then take your credit card details. That is the end of section one. You now have half a minute to check your answers. Now turn to section 2. Track 21. Section 2. You will hear someone talking on the radio about a running event. First, you have some time to look at questions 11 to 17. Now listen carefully and answer questions 11 to 17. Now, we're grateful to Fred McKinnon for coming into the studio today to give everyone a few tips about the City Marathon that's taking place next Saturday. Thanks, Shweta. Yes, we're all very excited about the big event. Let me just remind listeners that a marathon is a 26-mile or 42-kilometre race, and this year we have 12,000 runners taking part. So, if you're thinking of going out to support the runners, and I know that many of you are, here are some tips to help make your day more enjoyable. First of all, be certain to plan your day. Don't leave everything to the last minute. Many roads are going to be closed. We don't have exact times for these closures yet, but my big advice to you is don't rely on your car to get you anywhere. 
In fact, the best way to get around the town will be on foot. You may choose to cycle, but you still won't be able to go on roads near the runner's route. Now, we did a broadcast last week in which we told all our runners to wear the right kind of shoes, and I'm going to tell you to put on sensible clothes. A lot of visitors will be coming to the city. You may be hunting for someone in the race that you want to support. The weather may be hot or it may be wet. Which leads me on to another thing. Make sure you look at the forecast on Friday night. If it's going to rain, take an umbrella. And if it's going to be hot, take some drinks. However, please don't try to pass these to the runners. We already have hundreds of volunteers who'll be standing on the roadside, so let them give out the drinks. When you get into the town, find yourself a spot to stand in. You may well want to walk up and down the route, but please don't cross the road. There could be thousands of people running towards you, some very tired and not able to focus clearly. We don't want any accidents, and runners don't want obstacles like you in their path. What they do need is your support, particularly when their energies are low, so cheer them on, and for once, don't worry about noise. The louder, the better. Lastly, if you have friends or relatives who are taking part in the run, please don't say that you'll see them at the finish line. If everyone does that, the whole area will be terribly congested and you won't be able to find anyone. Well, that's most of the advice, but I'd like... Before you hear the rest of the talk, you have some time to look at questions 18 to 20. Now listen and answer questions 18 to 20. Now, I mentioned transport earlier, and I've just got a few more bits of information about travel on the day. As I said before, roads in the town centre will be closed, but if you need to be picked up at your home, then you could take a taxi some of the way. Unlike the trams and trains, however, They'll be held up on the roads, so passengers shouldn't expect them to be as punctual as they normally are. Don't be put off by this, though. There'll be extra drivers working that day, and you'll get one eventually. Um, if you're meeting up with friends and want to be around when the runners set off, uh, that's 9am, by the way, whatever end of the city you're coming from, I'd say use the trams. They still have routes that cross roads, and this will inevitably lead to some problems, but they're likely to have more reliable timetables than buses at this time of day. And, as you know, unlike taxis, they can carry plenty of passengers. Uh, lastly, the buses. Quite a number of bus routes will be altered slightly, and it's already been decided that some will be closed. There won't be fewer drivers, but they will be operating on different routes, and some will have longer breaks than they normally do. We'll be including a full list of all the bus routes and numbers, and where they'll be going, in this week's local paper. So uh, look out for that. Well, um, that's it for me. Uh, back to you, Shweta. Thanks very much, Fred. That is the end of section 2. You now have half a minute to check your answers.
Now turn to section 3. Track 22, section 3. You will hear a tutor and a student discussing a seminar. First, you have some time to look at questions 21 to 26. Now listen carefully and answer questions 21 to 26. Come in. Hi. Oh, hello, Ahmed. How are you? Fine, thanks. Have a seat. <clears throat> so, how do you think the seminar went last week? Oh, well... I enjoyed it, yes, though I'm not sure I really followed parts of the discussion that took place. <laughs> you know, about the theory and all that. Well, we can talk about that later, but were you comfortable in a group? Oh, it's better, I think, than working on your own, though you're comparing yourself all the time with the other students there. <laughs> okay. Well... Let's talk about how you did and look at some strategies to help you in the future. That would be great. Now, one of the things that students often overlook when they go to seminars is that you do need to prepare for them. You can't rely on other people. I know, and I did look at the results of the experiments we did in class and write them up beforehand, as you said. Yes, and that was good. It made it easier to analyze them. But you have to do some background reading as well. Did you get the list of articles I sent round? Mm-hmm. I started to read them. Okay. Well, you'll know that for next time. Yes. Yes, sure. So, let's move on to your participation in the seminar. Right. Perhaps you can tell me how you think that went. Yeah, well, I'm not used to talking to more than a couple of people. <laughs> It's very different from the way we learn in my home country. Yes, I appreciate that. So I think I, um, well, I know I should have included everyone, but I think I kept turning to the person next to me. <laughs> Is that because you were avoiding eye contact? I don't think so. I'm not shy. It's just habit, I think. Well, that will improve as we do more seminars. Uh-huh. Um, another difficulty is knowing when to speak. Like when it's your turn? Yes. Yeah. I, I felt I did wait for a pause. Yes, you handled that quite well. The thing I'm really concerned about is keeping up with the discussion. Ah, does your mind wander off? Sometimes. I jot down a lot of information, but I still find myself thinking about something else when lots of other students are talking. Hmm. If there's an assignment to do at the end of a group, that usually helps. <laughs> I'm sure it does. Okay. Now, the last thing I want to look at is the role that you play in the seminar. What do you mean? Well, when students work in groups, they don't all behave the same way. Some students are quiet, some look for support, some ask a lot of questions. Oh, that's a new idea to me. I don't know what I'm like. That's probably because you're thinking about your own performance all the time. I guess so. I mean... Should I be different in some way? What I would say is that when we do the next seminar, you should look more at the people around you. You know, look outside yourself. Like ask myself how they feel? Yes, or what they're looking for from the group. Okay. It doesn't take much, but it's important to watch what other students are doing. Okay, I'll do that. Fine. Now, I'm going to suggest... Before you hear the rest of the conversation, you have some time to look at questions 27 to 30.
Now listen and answer questions 27 to 30. Now, I'm going to suggest a couple of strategies for next week's seminar. Okay. That's great. I need to participate more. Well, it's not a question of saying more, but we need everyone to feel comfortable about giving their views. Then the discussion is better. Yes. So, you're a confident person. Should I make sure I'm near someone who's quiet? You can do, but it's more about how well you pay attention to other students. Okay, so I need to be attentive. Yes, and then encourage someone else to say more by saying, What did you mean when you said... Or, what do you think about the idea that... That way I'm talking. Yes, but you'll find that other people will talk too... You'll all start to get really involved. Right. They're good suggestions. The other thing that can really help is the way you take notes. Yeah, I, I know I write down everything, but I should be stricter with myself. Well, you actually need to think a few days ahead. Really? <laughs> yes. What's the topic, and what's the best way of making notes? I see. So I have a strategy when I walk in the room. Exactly. Mm. Then when you read through them later, they'll make sense, and you won't have to write them out again. <laughs> I always have to do that. The other thing I would say is that you should include a small column in your notes where you can jot down things you want to go back to before the seminar ends. Like a reminder? Yes. Notes aren't just for later. You can use them as a prompt when there's a pause in the discussion. Mm. That's been really helpful. Okay. See you in class tomorrow. Thanks. That is the end of Section 3. You now have half a minute to check your answers. Now turn to section 4. Track 23. Section 4. You will hear a lecture on desert plants. First, you have some time to look at questions 31 to 40. Now listen carefully and answer questions 31 to 40. In today's lecture, I'm going to continue our work on plants and talk about plants that live in the desert. Now, just a bit of background information first. As you know, about a third of the world is covered in desert and the sort of area they're found in is important. Deserts are usually created because the area of land where they lie is located in something that's called a rain shadow. Now this is a region that's beneath a mountain range and what happens is that the wind blows over the mountains towards the area but as it does so the air loses its moisture and becomes very dry. Because of this downwind location, rainfall often totals just a few inches a year, or in some regions, there's absolutely none. And you can imagine the effect of this. It means that 
Whatever rain does fall evaporates quickly from the ground, and that makes the soil salty and also leaves behind a whole range of other minerals as well. Now, despite this, deserts are home to many living things. In fact, they're second only to tropical rainforests in the variety of plant and animal species that live there. So, how do plants grow in a place that's so dry? Well, they're specially adapted to do this. In fact, many of the fascinating features of desert plants are adaptations. These are traits that help the plant survive in its harsh environment. And desert plants have two main adaptations. The first is that they have an ability to collect water and to store it. Some have large root systems and amazing internal water storage systems. The second adaptation is that they have features that can actually reduce water loss. And these are often very special leaf designs or additions to the plant structure. So let's have a look at some examples. Desert plants often look very different from any other plants. Okay, this first one is the saguaro cactus, which grows in North America. It looks a bit like an open hand with long fingers. This plant has a large network of roots that extend far, far away from its trunk. And these roots collect water after rain. Then the water is taken here to the green stem. This is where all its water is kept and it keeps the whole plant alive until the next rain comes. It's a pretty woody plant. In fact, um, its skeleton is actually used in building materials, so it's quite strong. This next plant is called the barrel cactus, named because it does look rather like a barrel. It can grow up to a meter in height, which is pretty big, and it has long yellow spines. Now, this plant has an interesting adaptation because its shape allows it to expand when it rains, hence the barrel, and store water in its spongy tissue. But then it shrinks in size during dry times as it uses the stored water. So that's a clever design. This third cactus, often just one plant reaching upwards, has these white hairs all over its surface. It's called the old man cactus because of the white hairs, and these help the plant reflect the hot desert sun. So this adaptation is a water conservation aid, if you like. Another adaptation not directly connected with water, but with survival, is found on something like the prickly pear cactus. There are hundreds of these in the Mexican desert. I'm sure you've seen them on films and adverts. Um, yes, so because desert plants store water in their spongy tissue, animals will eat them. So the plant has sharp thorns, specially designed to prevent the predator from being able to, well, get near it at all. Our next plant is called the desert spoon. This plant has long leaves that fan out and they're very succulent because they can also store water inside. However, they're also usually very tough and this helps keep the water inside and also makes them less tasty. Finally, we come to the aloe plant. This is one that many people keep in their homes. It's an attractive plant which has leaves that look and feel rather waxy. This surface behaves in a similar way to a plastic wrapper and helps the plant to hold the water in. It's a wonder plant, this one. Its juice has been used as a medicine for centuries and even today you can find it in products on the pharmacist's shelves or in creams and lotions. Okay. Well, we're going to take a closer look. That is the end of section four. You now have half a minute 
to check your answers.